when I was visiting Brookhaven Labs and working on the particle accelerator, taking data and using that in my last body of work, I was also invited to take a visit to something they call their light lab. And in the light lab, what they're doing is taking concentrated beams of light and they're focusing them on protein structures that are suspended in liquid crystal. And that the images that you get are these incredible 3D images called surface images that look like space rock. And I thought they were beautiful images to work with. And proteins are also the building blocks of, uh, they, they provide the electrical energy and the information that tells the cell what to do. So it was fascinating from the subject matter because it's about the origin of life. And it was incredible as visual subject matter because they're phenomenal looking uh, equations. draw all the time as a kid like all kids and I guess I never stopped doing it and here I am 50 years later still doing it. Uh, well the overall subject of the artwork is usually something to do with science and technology and I think that's the new paradigm. It's not so new, the internet's been around for a while but I think if you look at our age it's technology and science that are going to be the images and the representation of who we are in our culture at this time. Oh boy, one of the people that I used to love is Piero della Francesca. I love older Renaissance artists. Um, I love Raphael's School of Athens at the Vatican. That's an incredible painting. Um, 
contemporary artists, obviously someone like Duchamp, Warhol, I think, are the most important artists of this century, Pollock. Um, I saw my first Pollock painting when I was 12, and that's definitely one of those life-changing experiences I saw at the Albright Knox Art Museum. When I saw that painting, it was huge in scale for a 12-year-old painting called Convergence, one of Pollock's last paintings, drip paintings. And the freedom and the energy and I saw in that work just made me want to do the same thing. I knew at that moment that's what I wanted to do. I was doing a lot of reading and I was looking at what I thought was the paradigm of our age and I realized it was technology. I was reading a lot of Foucault at the time and I started looking around and thought, well, the computer is the representation, the tool of technology. So in the early 80s, I started to use uh, animation computers just to do simple pixelations, something that a regular laptop computer could do in two seconds. In those days, you had to have a computer the size of a room to do something very simple. So I started playing with breaking up the image the way a computer could break up a, an image. And I started looking at the way paint could represent an idea. And I started looking at the Rorschach blot by Herman Rorschach, the Rorschach test. And I took those pieces of paint, which were psychological ink blot tests that gave you some idea of the psychological health of the viewer, and I took those ink blots and I put them on a uh, computer and started pixelating them, and then put them into the silkscreen format. The early work before the computer work, I was actually uh, a figurative painter. I was doing the representational themes of workers, people at work. I did a portrait of the head of AT&T in front of all the long lines. Um, farmers riding tractors, um, paintings of machines that I thought represented the concept of labor. And I was thinking about financial and economic relationships around the culture. The last show I did was in New York City, uh, at a gallery in Chelsea called Universal Concepts. And I had been given the opportunity to visit Brookhaven Labs. And when I went to visit the lab with a group of artists and curators, I thought the most interesting thing in terms of my interest was the particle accelerator that they were using. And in the particle accelerator, they're taking protons and they're smashing them together at the speed of light, at the temperature of absolute zero. And the point of all this is to get particles inside the protons called quarks. To see if they can get those quarks to exist in a gaseous plasma state, to actually leave the particle and free float with other quarks in a plasma state called quark gluon plasma. And at the time of Big Bang, all matter was in a gaseous plasma state. And I thought it was very interesting to think about matter and time as plasma and the beginning and the origin of the universe. And at the same time, I'd also been looking at Neolithic Chinese pottery, which was the very first thing, some of the earliest things that early man did um, to express themselves artistically. So painted Neolithic pottery, which is anywhere up to 10,000 years BC, was some of the earliest recorded efforts by man. I thought it'd be very interesting to do a kind of timeline between the painted pottery from 10,000 BC to the most advanced scientific thinking of our age today, which is working with the particle accelerator, which investigates the origin of matter, which is what the pottery is made of. So I did kind of a timeline, a history painting. The DNA series was started in the early 90s. I had been doing a series of portraits uh, about people's interiors, and I was using a lot of high-tech medical imaging systems. So, for example, I did an MRI scan of my mother, a full-body MRI scan, to do a much like, thinking much like, you know, Whistler's uh, portrait of his mother. And I did a show that involved working around the whole circle of portraiture, doing self-portrait, portrait of the artist's mother, portrait of the dealer, portrait of the artist Dr. Ala Van Gogh, thinking of his portraits of uh, Dr. Gachet, portrait of the critic, uh, thinking of Manet's portrait of Zola, uh, did the critic uh, Pierre Restini. So I did this kind of circle of the people around the artist. And these images were x-rays, MRIs, sonograms, CAT scans, 
Um, and eventually, a woman came to me, a woman named Isabel Goldsmith, and asked me to commission her portrait. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to use another bit of technology that I had not played with yet, and that was do a genetic portrait. So I went to England, and I took a sample of her blood, and I took it to a uh, genetic, uh, one of the institutions that was working on the genome, the John Innes Center. We took her white blood cells and uh, autoclaved them so that the nuclei separated. We took the, in the nuclei is the chromosomes. We put that in a French bean culture and cultivated that for about 14 days where the nuclei divided and went through the process of mitosis. And then after 14 days, we sliced up the bean culture and photographed the uh, chromosomes and their different phases of reproduction. So I took those photographed photographs and I put them in a computer, as I had done with my other imagery, and put them in a format to adjust the image and then download them as a half tone negative to be reproduced as a, a film positive for a silk screen and then I took the images and silk screened them on canvas. Well, I think all art is really about a collaboration and I, I collaborate with a lot of people. I work with scientists that help me get the imagery and the research and that working with them helps shape the kind of images I'll use. So their vision is a part of my work. I work with uh, a computer technician, imaging guy, John Wilton for years. I've worked with Colin Goldberg for years. And the assistant, no matter who it is in the actual printing process in the studio, that, that person always puts a certain amount of input into the work. They have ideas, I'm open to those ideas. I'm into sharing, I'm into listening. So, you know, it's more like producing a movie. And the assistants are part of those people on the film that I would have in production assistants. They're the cinematographer, they could be the producer, they could be the production manager, and I listen to all of these people and, and take their feedback seriously. So the work is definitely a collaborative process.
I started using silkscreen because previous to my work in silkscreen, I was working figuratively. And I was spending a month on a canvas, sometimes more, rendering the actual rendering, the painting, the drawing to make something representational. And I found that the rendering made me feel like a kind of a slave to my own technique. I want something that would allow me to use energy quickly and not be in this sort of long time frame where I had to feel like I was not involved artistically or creatively in that process of rendering. So what I loved about the silkscreen was the same thing that someone like Warhol and Rauschenberg loved. It let you get an image into the work quickly. The work comes together all at a moment. And that's also the means by which we receive our information. Silkscreen at that time, it's just a mechanical means with, with which newspapers, magazines, and the cult culture represents itself. So I thought it was just a perfect tool to use. One shot deal, but it always prints better if I 